Howdy, it's Kyle with another installment of Examining Interesting Maps, where we take a look at some wonderful depictions of geography. I'll leave links to the other six videos in this series in the description box, but let's get into it. Examining Interesting Maps, Part 7. This map is very timely. It shows housing affordability in the U.S. And this kind of backs up what I was saying in older videos, talking about how it's not just the high housing costs in the West, but also the low wages in the South that makes things unaffordable. So you can see in the West a lot of red. Those are some of the more scenic, some of the more pretty areas for the most part. And it's the same thing in the South. You look at the Southern Appalachians along the Tennessee-North Carolina border, most of the coastal Carolinas, and pretty much all of South Florida is really expensive. But look at that big ocean of green near the Great Lakes and the Great Plains. Houses in the Great Lakes and Great Plains regions tend to cost about the same as ones in the southeast, but wages are higher up north. And I expect to see in the next 10 years or so a migration reversal where people are moving back up to the northern cities and urban areas to get away from the expensive costs of the south. Here are satellite images over Phoenix from 1985 and from 2011. So you can see just how much land has been taken over by urban development. And this is over the course of only 25 years. Phoenix is one of those areas on that previous map that has very unaffordable housing. But as you can see by these images, they keep building more and more housing, and it still stays really expensive. It's also interesting to note just how much agricultural land there was in this area before it was housing. Not a lot of water for crops, not a lot of water for people either. This map shows the U.S.-Mexico border and some of the towns that cross the border. So you look in the far west, San Diego and Tijuana. Downtown San Diego and the heart of the metro area is not right along the border, but downtown Tijuana is pretty close to the U.S. border. And then the small town of Tecate, there's really nothing on the American side of this. And then certain other ones like Mexicali and San Luis Rio, Colorado are much larger than the cities on the American side. And then you have El Paso and Juarez. Both of these cities has the downtown near the border. And this feels more like one big city as opposed to San Diego and Tijuana. And then going down through Texas, mostly smaller towns along the border until you get to Laredo. That's the busiest automotive traffic border crossing in North America. And at the far east along the Gulf Coast is where you have Brownsville and Matamoros. So the Mexican border area is a really interesting part of the country and it's in the news often but many people haven't really been down there to explore it. So if you ever have a chance to drive along the border and check out some of these towns, do it. It's really cool. This map depicts the county that is home to the highest point in each state. The green counties are ones in which the highest point is located wholly within that county. And the ones in purple are ones where the highest point in the state straddles a county line. One thing very interesting about this is that most states, their highest point is located in a county that borders another state. And you look at this list and only Alaska, Idaho, Utah, Colorado, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Wisconsin, Ohio, and Maine have their highest point in a county that is not along a state line or along a big body of water. And speaking of elevation, this compares the lowest elevation in Colorado to the highest elevation in many other states. The lowest point in Colorado is just over 3,300 feet, which is the highest low point in the U.S., and that is higher than the highest point in 18 other states. So yeah, Colorado be high. Now we'll take a look at a couple of maps depicting climate. This map was created in 2020, and what it shows is places that the climate of that place will be more like in 60 years. So, for example, Portland, Oregon, by 2080, the climate will be much more like Sacramento, California, than it is now. Or for Minneapolis, it'll be more like Kansas City or Wichita. Washington, D.C., much more like Little Rock or Dallas. Denver, more like the Texas Panhandle. And Los Angeles, more like Cabo San Lucas. And this is an interactive map you can do yourself. You can go to this website and make one of these maps yourself. You enter a city name and it will show you what city your climate will be like in 60 years. I certainly won't be alive, but many of you will be. Check it out. Here's one for the climate nerds. This shows what the climate classifications would be if the Earth rotation was backwards. It's not quite the same as just putting opposite climates in a certain area. So yes, the southeastern U.S. would be more desert and the southwestern U.S. would be more humid subtropical, but that isn't the case all throughout the world. And this would be a big change for most people, but for people in Alaska or northern Canada, it's still really cold. 
This is a very pretty map that shows total known global tropical cyclones in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. So as you can see, many more tropical cyclones, whether they be called hurricanes or typhoons, in the northern hemisphere, with Southeast Asia getting the brunt of most of the worst ones. You see significantly fewer cyclones in the southern hemisphere, but northern Australia does get hit with quite a few. And I do like that one random one off the southeast coast of Brazil. It's almost as if Mother Nature went down to southeast Brazil and was like, I'm going to try something out here. I'm not sure if this is going to work. She gave it a shot and was like, yeah, not worth it. But speaking of Brazil and Australia, here's how the two countries compare in terms of area. The two countries are similarly sized and similarly shaped as well, but Brazil's population is about nine times as much as Australia's. So basically, the entire population of Australia is not much different than the Sao Paulo metropolitan area. And there probably aren't two more different ecosystems on the planet than the Amazon rainforest and the Australian outback. This map depicts the longest non-stop flight currently used in the world. So you can see the current longest one in the world is New York to Singapore. And here's one for the flat earth crowd. If you're flying to Singapore from Los Angeles, you'll start off going west. You also have a couple of very long flights from the UK to Australia. One goes to Perth on the west coast and the other goes to Darwin on the north coast. I would imagine Darwin being a small town is probably where they have the hub. Once you land there, you fly to any other town in Australia. Also, a really long flights on this list are New York, Cotter, and Dubai to Auckland, New Zealand, and a very curious non-stop flight from Dallas-Fort Worth to Melbourne, Australia. Also interesting is that the flight from San Francisco to India goes to Bangalore. I would think the non-stop flight would go to either Delhi or Kolkata, and then from there you get on a flight to go somewhere else in India, as opposed to flying over the entire country, essentially, to get to Bangalore. I'm not sure if there's a disproportionate number of immigrants from that part of India in the U.S., but nonetheless, that's where the flight goes. Here's an area comparison size between Manhattan and Walt Disney World outside of Orlando, Florida. The purple outline is the outline of the Walt Disney World complex. And as you can see, it's a little bit bigger than all of Manhattan. And if you've ever driven around the Walt Disney World complex in that area, you know just how long it takes to get around there and just how much space it takes up on the map. It's so big, it would be like taking a subway from Jersey City to LaGuardia Airport. But yeah, Disney World be huge. From the real New York to the fake New York. If you're a gamer, you might recognize this map. This shows the fictional city of Liberty City from the Grand Theft Auto video games. This is the game's version of New York City. So if you look at the north-south oriented island in the middle of the map, that's called Algonquin, which is the game's version of Manhattan. At the south end is where you have a downtown and an island that has a version of the Statue of Liberty. You can see the version of Central Park in the north central part of the island. In the northeastern portion of the map is the part of town called Bohan, which is the game's version of the Bronx. It's a little more blue collar, a little more rough around the edges and industrial. The big island to the southeast, the northern part of that is called Dukes as opposed to Queens, and the southern part is called Broker as opposed to Brooklyn. At the far east end is the airport. And the far western island is Alderney, which is the game's version of New Jersey. A lot of folks thought that that southern end of the New Jersey portion is actually supposed to be Staten Island, but because it's mostly industrial and warehousing kind of stuff, I don't think it's supposed to be Staten Island. I think it's just supposed to be another part of New Jersey, and there really isn't a depiction of Staten Island in the game. But this game, which came out about 15 years ago, does do a pretty good job of replicating the real New York. This map shows the change in snowpack of western states since 1955. The darker the color, the larger the drop in snowpack levels, and if it's blue, it's actually been going up. So the first thing you'll notice is a lot more yellow, orange, and red than blue. But it's also really interesting where you're seeing the most red and the most blue. The places that seem to be getting the biggest decrease in snowpack levels are mostly in Oregon. There's also quite a bit of orange and red in western Montana and central Idaho, as well as northern California and northern Nevada. Although quite surprisingly, honestly, is that the Sierra Nevada in central California is where you're seeing some of the least snowpack shrinkage. In fact, there's been some snowpack increase since 1955. But with that being said, the portions that are showing up red on this map tend to have much higher snowpack levels in the first place, so a bigger decrease it still might have more overall snow, but just a bigger decrease in the amount of snowpack. 
The front range of the Rocky Mountains just west of Denver seems to be kind of like the southern Sierra Nevada and is doing okay. But no matter how you slice it, the water situation in the west is getting worse and worse. As an American, I find this map very interesting. It shows which parts of Canada at the county level has had the most population growth in the past five to six years. So what you see here is very similar reflection to what you're seeing in the US, a big population decrease in some of the more remote rural areas, with most of the population increase being in the urban and suburban areas. However, just like in the US, some of the inner cities of the biggest cities are decreasing in population. Although overall, the urban population seems to be going up. It's also worth noting that a lot of Toronto Metro is decreasing in population, but all of Montreal Metro is going up in population. And that probably has a lot to do with the fact that Toronto is very expensive and Montreal is reasonably affordable compared to other big cities. But regardless of what it shows, this is a very pretty map. Here's a pretty fun map that shows conversational fillers in different parts of Europe. I'd really love to know from Europeans how accurate this map is, but it is a pretty cool way of showing what people say in that language to kind of cover up something like, uh, um. But fillers can be, you know, kind of a little bit different depending on where you're, you know, from kind of stuff. But, um, yeah, we use different, you know, fillers in different parts of the world. And I wanted to end the video with a cute map of the world. The continents are made up of iconic animals that live in that region. And just a really cool looking overall map. I'm not sure who A. Paz is, but cool map. So that's Examining Interesting Maps Part 7. And again, I will leave links to the other six videos in this series in the description. And I post one of these every few months, so look for Part 8 coming soon. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve. And subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about geography. I'm doing maps videos like this with all kinds of other things about geography. And I'm a bit of a nerd, so everything comes from a more nerdy type perspective. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King, signing out. I'd like to give a special thanks to my superior supporters on Patreon, especially Dan from Rancho Cordova, whose pin is in the Incline Village area along Lake Tahoe. If you're interested in supporting the channel or purchasing a pin for the viewer pin map, please visit my Patreon page, link in the description. And thank you very much for all the support.